We now know air can be forced to ionize if given a large enough magnitude of electric field. Now the question is, I know that I can pump charges up and store them over here, right? Which is why, which is what I feel when I keep my hands somewhere far away. It's not on right now, but it can be. But if this is going to act like a pump, and and very soon we will learn how it does that. And I keep putting charges onto this. Can I just keep doing that infinitely long? In other words, can I just put an infinitely large amount of charge on this? Or does it have some capacity after which it will start? The charges will start spilling out of this, right? So to, to, to look at that right now, let's let's actually take this out. Let's imagine it's still connected. And if we only care about this, wow! Isn't this what they do when they do crystal ball gazing and they look into the future? Yeah, but literally, I think I'm looking into my past because. I'm looking at my reflection, which is kind of a few nanoseconds, one nanosecond past version of me. So at least it's showing me the past. But what I do care about is it, because it's a metal and it's a round metal. I'm going to imagine that I keep putting some charges on this right now, and uh, if I keep doing that, the charge density on this will keep increasing because I'm not changing the surface area, but I'm just adding more and more charges onto this. Now, after I keep doing this for a while, what might happen? Does this create an electric field in the region around it? It does, right? Which is what if it had been connected there, I was feeling when I was far away, right? So this does create an electric field in the region around, which is strongest very, very close to the surface. Now, as I keep increasing the charge density, will there come a point when this electric field, as it keeps increasing, reach a value that is going to be high enough, which we now know is three into ten to the power of six volt per meter, so that air will ionize, and if it does. If the air in the region does ionize, it means some of the atoms there are losing their electrons. Then, the electrons in this metal will go and compensate for them. What does that mean? That means that the electrons over here will start spilling outside. Now, whenever I'm saying electrons spilling outside, you should always imagine that the same argument would hold if I just had positive charges over here, and the opposite happened. I'm using electrons spilling because it's easier to visualize. Yeah, I could have just said charges. And you'll have to imagine the whole thing happening in the opposite direction. So, in, for convenience, I'm imagining that I'm putting electrons onto this. Yeah. So, as I keep doing that, what can happen after a point, as you can see, is the electric field at the closest regions can become high enough, and then charge can start spilling out effectively because the air around gets ionized. And when that happens, you you stop. You reach a limit of how much charge you can put because any more you put, this keeps going into the Atmosphere and the charge density of this metal remains a constant after that. It's hit its, hit its limit. So we know all of this, but can we be a little more mathematical about? It? Can we actually understand it quantitatively? Right. The more the charge density, the more the electric field. But by how much exactly? To answer that question, do you remember that we calculated the electric field just outside a conductor like this? Right. What did we use? We used Gauss law. We draw a Gaussian surface partially inside and partially outside, and Use Gauss law, which is charge enclosed by epsilon naught equals the net flux, and if you do that, you will get sigma into a, which is the charge enclosed, divided by epsilon naught equals e into a, because we assume e to be constant in that region, and the a's cancel, and you get the electric field in that local region to be equal to sigma by epsilon naught, clearly dependent on sigma, which is the charge density in that region, the surface charge density to be precise. So with this in place, you can now calculate what the electric field will be. If you know the charge density, and what the charge density's maximum value will be, if you know what the dielectric breakdown value, breakdown electric field value is for air. Now, this spilling out of electrons into the atmosphere is called corona discharge. Corona discharge, right? Because after a point, the air around begins to get uh, ionized, and the reason it has a name is because if you really switch off the lights, you can actually see a faint glow if this was charged. And that's just the air ionized, the electrons there jumping back into their shells and giving out photons. Now this is pretty different from a spark, though, right? A spark has two, one starting point and a destination, and it's a stream. It's a waterfall of electrons between those two points. But here it's more of a reservoir of electrons just overflowing, right? Charges just overflowing, and that's what we call as corona discharge. But we still haven't answered the question: How should we shape lightning conductors? We began with that question. If you were to build a building and put a lightning conductor on top, should it be as sharp as possible, or would you want to make it a little blunt? And the answer to that lies in our understanding of corona discharge. 
To answer the question of lightning conductors, we might have to start at a place which looks slightly different. Let's imagine I have a metal, a conductor, to be more general, which is very irregular. It has some random shapes, some sharp points, some blunt areas. And I ask the question, is the entire surface of this conductor equipotential? By that, I mean the potential difference between any two points in that conductor is zero. Is that true? Yes, it is. We proved it. Now, is all the charge on this conductor resting at its outer surface? Yes. Right? We showed that using Gauss law long ago. Then my question is, is the charge density throughout this conductor the same? In other words, if you take a small region, the amount of charge you'll find in that region, will it be same throughout this conductor? And the answer is it won't be. Now the intuition for this is that if you have a really sharp point, imagine a conductor which is like sort of like, like this and then becomes sharp at one point over there. Then if you put some charges in the volume of that conductor, right? Some X, whenever I say charges, I mean excess charges, right? So when you put these excess charges, they're going to try and get as far away from each other as possible. So they're going to go really, really far. Now what's the farthest they can go? Those sharp points are where they, they can get crowded and be as far away from the rest of the region as possible. But that's just an intuition, just a way of looking at this, right? Can we be more precise? So I'm claiming that the surface charge density is the highest in the regions that are very, very sharp. You can ask, that's fine, why should I believe you? And the answer will be, maybe we can model this scenario like this, right? A conductor which has a blunt region and a sharp region can be thought of as two spherical shells, spheres, however you want it to be, because you know it doesn't matter, all the charge is going to rest on the surface. So one small ball of some radius Ra and one large ball of radius Rb connected by a wire and kept really, really far away. Now, why are we keeping it really far away? We don't want the charges on one to affect the charges on the other, right? Once you've done that, why are we connecting it using a wire though? So that the both of them are at the same potential. Effectively, it's just one metallic body, which means the entire body must be equipotential. Now the question is, how much charge density is going to be on this ball and on that ball? How do we even going about thinking about a question like this? We derived the value for the potential on the surface of a spherical shell or sphere, which was the charge on it divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r, where that's the radius of that shell. So what will be the potential of this one? QA divided by 4 pi epsilon naught ra. And this, the potential of this one will be QB divided by 4 pi epsilon naught rb. Now these both are constrained to be equal because it's one volume. So if you equate the two, the four pi's will cancel and you'll get QB by RB equals QA by RA, right? What does this mean? Here you look at this, you know that, you're not surprised, the, Q, the larger ball has a larger amount of charge. So there is more charge on the larger ball than on the smaller ball. But that's not the question we asked. We don't care about the charge. We care about the charge density, the surface charge density. Now for that, we have QB by RB equals QA by RA. Basically this means, the amount of charge on a ball is proportional to the radius, which is not surprising. The more the radius, the more the charge. But what is the surface charge density proportional to? It's the total charge divided by the total surface area. So it's clearly proportional to the amount of charge, which means it's proportional to the radius of it, right? But it's inversely proportional to the area, surface area, which is 4 pi r squared, which means the surface charge density is proportional to the radius, right? But inversely proportional to the radius squared, which in effect means it's inversely proportional to the radius itself. So the surface charge density is inversely proportional to the radius for a given ball. Now we can come back to our original picture of a metal which has different radii of curvature at different points on it, right? So a metal in general could have, could have places which are sharp, places which are blunt and sharp can be said in a different way. I say a point that is sharp basically has a very, very, very small radius of curvature. Yeah, the R in that region, if you imagine that to be a very small sphere over there, will be super small, which means the charge density there will be extremely large, right? Which means that the electric field in that region just outside will also be extremely large because sigma by epsilon naught will become really, really large. Which means, if at all there is a point where it's likely for charges to leak out, it becomes those sharp points. So if you take a conductor, its sharpest points are where 
leakage is highly likely right so also gives us one more uh, real world uh, question which is if you consider this to be a perfect sphere right and then calculate the question the answer to the question how close should i get before there is a spark or if you take two perfectly parallel plates and ask the question how close should i get them before there is a spark you'll get an answer but it will so happen that if you do it in the real world you will be so in for a surprise because you'll predict maybe somewhere here is when it'll happen it'll happen right over here and why is that that's because we would have modeled this to be a perfect sphere we would have modeled the plates to be perfectly parallel perfectly smooth such things don't exist in the real world so as you get closer there will be some sharp point which will actually be closer which will have a higher charge density it will start this off and then there will be a spark towards you so don't take your calculations assuming these ideal spheres and ideal planes too seriously which brings us finally to the question how should we build a lightning conductor right if the lightning conductor is just a flat surface it could be the building itself right doesn't make a difference that would be bad because we're not really telling the lightning to strike a particular place by building up charge over there so we wanted to be something like a rod which is really focused but what would happen if we make it super sharp if we make it really really sharp then our whole point which was to have some charge building up at that lightning conductor tip would be lost right what do we want we want some charge to build up at that tip so that when lightning is effectively looking for a place to strike this is the place that seems as the most likely or the most easy candidate but if you make it so sharp that so it should be good enough it should hold enough charges but not so good that the electric field over there becomes so large at that tip that it starts having corona discharge giving away its charges to the atmosphere if that happens the point is lost because now lightning does not know where to strike because the ideal amount of charge you can hold there is becoming lower now so what can you do build everything similar but blunt out the really sharp points make them somewhat smooth so that there is some charge build up and there is no corona discharge